today we are going to look at Dev Diary 137 for Crusader Kings 3, Machinations of a Clan. And I've never actually read through these or discussed them. Well, I've read them, but I've never discussed them. So I, th I thought we'll try something new today. This will be me reading a bunch of stuff, stumbling over certain words, and then uh, giving some thoughts of mine onto the topic. So let's see. What are they writing? Salutations! It's been a while since last I wrote a dev diary, so a quick reintroduction might be in order. I'm Emil, aka Servancourt, one of the Resident CK3 game designers. I've been on the project since way before release and tend to mostly focus on a lot of game mechanics and system systemic features. Oh, I'm so sorry, not system features, systemic features. <laughs> Which in fact brings me to why I'm here today. When we settled in on Persia as the focus of our upcoming flavor pack, we soon came to realize that this would be an excellent opportunity to revisit the clan government and give it a much needed update, which I appreciate. Uh, it's something in Crusader Kings 3 that is a little bit sad compared to Crusader Kings 2. Um, the variety of how you play based on your government type like clan, feudal, tribe, etc. It's it's very samey. So let's see. Clans as you currently know them are very similar to feudal. Well, <laughs> yes, they sure are. There are only two real points of difference between them. Opinion is a major factor in their obligations, meaning that a vassal's opinion of their lieges affects them in how much taxes and levies they're willing to give to their liege. This is done in contracts for feudal, generally. Meaning that a vassal's opinion of their liege affects how much taxes and levies they will give to their liege. Secondly, they have access to and utilize vassal contracts, albeit in a slightly stripped down version with less available options than their feudal counterparts. This begs the question, how can we make clan government stand out? We've already identified one aspect above, so our first action and problem to solve is this, how do or should clans manage their vassals? Secondly, and perhaps much more important, is what does a clan actually represent? What does the name mean for gameplay? But I'm getting ahead of myself, let's start with the first question, shall we? And have a look at clan obligations now. It's an interesting approach, I don't know if I agree with this. Um, I spend very little time managing my vassals. After succession, and once you've brought everyone under control, um, there's really not much to do with your vassals or, or nothing that really requires your attention barring taking care of those that would form factions against you or potentially rebel. But that's something you have kind of under control at a certain point. So I don't, I don't know if that's the thing that should put the clans apart or any government type apart from each other. But let's see what they have. Tax jurisdictions and tax collectors. While we knew we wanted to add something new to clan obligations, we had to ask ourselves how do we want, uh, how we wanted to make it different. As with all things Crusader Kings, adding a new element that makes use of characters felt like a natural fit to give obligations some personality, if you will. Meet the tax collector. All right. So, in what menu does the tax collector exist? So looking at this, um, I don't see a highlight here. I don't know what part of this it is. Um, it's not a sub-menu of any of what we have right now. So this might just be a concept thing. Or it's that button down there. I, I believe it's that button down there. I got Crusader Kings 3 running in the background right now, which is where we get the lovely background music as well. So let me check. And yes, indeed... Uh, that button down there does not yet exist, so I would say that this down here is the tax collector button. Or the tax jurisdictions, right. So... <laughs> Hello, welcome, glad you could make it. Uh, yes, I do not mind <laughs> uh, you being here at all, happy to have you. Let's see if any of what I'm going to talk about makes sense to you today. <laughs> Also, let me 
pull up chat maybe and maybe put it in a place where we can actually see it. Yeah. Like that. There we go. Now we got chat going in case more people chime in. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I mean, no, no, too, late. too late to learn anything, right? Um, okay, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused to start out with. Why is this a special button? Uh, we already have council uh, and court positions, yeah? How is the tax collected different from that? Why not just kind of add it to that? Not sure, maybe it's a space thing. That could be a problem. But let's see. You'll have access to a limited number of tax jurisdictions to which you assign your clan vessel as taxpayers. Okay. Allowing you to gain both taxes and levies from your subjects. The jurisdiction requires a tax collector to function, however, so before you can collect any taxes, you need to appoint one of your courtiers as a tax collector for each jurisdiction. Okay, are there any limits to this? I wonder. So you can appoint a tax collector, tax ju jurisdiction is untaxed, taxpayers 2 out of 12. Okay, so there are limits here. So you can't just say you have a kingdom of 36 counties. You can't just uh, divide it up. Some places are going to remain untaxed unless I'm assuming, like I don't know, it says taxpayers and they spoke about making a character balance. So I would assume that this goes for the leaders rather than the area. So if you have a duke with however many uh, counties, they will still be just one rather than the amount of their counties. So let's see. You have the aptitude, all fine, all good. Tax collectors are in charge of collecting levies and gold. We already know that. Only unlanded characters can be tax collected. That's interesting. Okay, so your uh, counts and your dukes and your kings and what have you, none of these can be a tax collector. They have to be unlanded. Interesting. I like that. I like that. I, I often find to have people on my council that are unlanded. Not so much in later gameplay, but early on. So having an extra thing that they can do to get better opinion of me, well, that's, not, that's not too bad. With tax collectors, you won't manage the obligations of your vassals directly. Instead, you manage them through your tax collector. Similar to a court position, a tax collector uses their aptitude to set the obligations of the vassal assigned to them. Higher levels of aptitude means that you get more taxes and levies. Aptitude is primarily based on their skills, with learning being the more important one. But their opinion of you also plays a significant part. To maximize use of your tax collectors, you'll want to find and appoint a skilled character, yeah? And then put the sway scheme to good use in order to squeeze as much gold from your subjects as possible. All right. So they're suggesting be on the good side of your tax collector and be on the good side of the people he's collecting taxes from. Sounds about right to me. It's very, very real worldy, right? If, if everyone hates the tax man, people are kind of less inclined to really pay the tax or, or try and find loopholes, yeah? Especially if they have to send men to die uh, on top of paying tax, which we generally are exempt from, uh, at least here in, in Central Europe, I, I would say. So, uh, let's see. While your tax collector act as your intermediaries, you are still able to I exact a certain degree of control of how they should manage your vassals. This is where tax decrees come into play. Tax decrees essentially how you want your vassals to be taxed, changing the obligations and providing an assortment of additional benefits. That sounds a little bit like uh, vassal contracts, but with extra steps, honestly. But... Look at that. They've given them little nice pictures and multiple options. And yeah, okay, that's that's slightly different, at least visually, from Vassal Contract. So, okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, we got Basic Taxes, which does this here. Base Obligation Supply. Um, I'm a little bit sad that it doesn't really say here what it does. I think this is the effect. So if you click through these, you would get other effects. All right, all good, let's see. With the introduction of tax decrees, uh, it made perfect sense to move over some aspects of vassal contracts to this new system instead. Ah, okay. <laughs> For example, this is where you'll find Ikta, Ghazi, and Yiza, Yizia to use as you see fit. While you won't have to bother with decrees if you don't want to, they do give you opportunities to min-max in different ways. Decrees change the obligations of your vassals, either increasing or reducing them. 
in exchange for other boons. Take Ikta as an example. Ikta is a great option if you find yourself with vassals who are slightly upset, just enough for you to start taking notice. And if you also if you also find yourself okay, being at war frequently, as Ikta provides you with increased men at arms, damage based on the number of assigned vassals alongside an opinion bonus. Alright, okay. So tax farming system where local magnates are given wide authority to collect taxes on behalf of the state. In return, they must provide significant accounts of soldiers for their leech. So they give you less money, but they should give you more men, which uh, from the flavor text, it, it sounds like they, you know, they must provide significant amounts of soldiers for their leech. Um... But here, you get a levies multiplier of minus 20%. Ah, uh, Huh? And you get a men at arms damage. Liege per vassal. Okay, so per vassal in that area, you get a 1% uh, damage to men at arms. That could be good. But I'm not entirely sure. I... Eh, well... Sounds all like rocket science to you. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll jump into the game uh, once we're through the dev diary, which I'm now realizing might be a little bit longer than I thought it would be. Uh, and maybe some of these things then make sense, potentially. Anyway, let's let's see. Let's continue on. What, what else do they have in store? One thing to consider is that the modifiers applied to the obligations occur on level as set by your tax collector, which makes decrees more or less powerful depending on the tax. Okay, yeah. Again, looking at the effects of ICTA, 20% less to taxes and levies won't be very noticeable if your tax collector has a terrible uh, aptitude. This makes ICTA very rewarding for the price you pay, since the gain benefit is pretty good. If your tax collector is excellent, on the other hand, you'll feel the impact of those 20%. Wait. What? That doesn't make sense. So if my tax collector is horrible, I'm fine with the minus 20%, but if my tax collector is good, then the 20% is, is going to be bad? What? <laughs> okay, trust me, at this point, this sounds like rocket science to me as well. I can't follow what, it, what they're saying. It, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, all right, so that's the tax jurisdictions and collectors. Fine, okay, yeah, it's not... I don't know, it's not, it's not different enough to me. Well, let's see what else they have in store here. There's still some to go. House Unity. As the name suggests, clan should be all about the clan itself and its members. Agreed. Something that we really don't represent at the moment, nor does it have any real impact on how you play the game. To solve this and put a significantly larger emphasis on your house when you are playing as a clan, we're introducing House Unity. Okay. Unity represents the overall state of a house, essentially the internal relationships between its members and the attitude they have towards each other. Reminds me of CK2 so far, okay. In many ways, unity is a result of how you choose to interact with your fellow house members. We show everything regarding unity in each house view, allowing you to easily inspect your own unity and the unity of other houses. Okay, so we get this new... Uh, tab here, which has you. Oh, I like the art. <laughs> it certainly is. Um, I mean, at the very least, you can appreciate the art. I, I would, I would think. Um, while this here is a 3D character, you you got all this uh, very nice uh, background art here. I, I like that. That's 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 looking good. Looking good. Recent Unity changes. Uh, the house is impassive. I would say this is good. This is probably bad. Like This looks like it's withering and this is uh, clearly flowering and eventually blooming. So I like this um, plant uh, symbolism they got going here. Yeah. Also blue with water, right? And the dried old desert dirt. It's just... I like this. This is, this is nice. That's nice symbolism. Um... The house succession law is impassive succession. Oh, are we tying a succession here into how everyone is feeling? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, house members may challenge their house head in order to take their place. Okay, all right. 
monthly lifestyle experience plus 10%. That's important. That's big. That's good. So uh, let's see. We measure unity on a scale of 0 to 200 divided up into five distinct ranges or levels. Uh, blah, 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 blah. By default, most houses start in the middle, essentially neutral level. The levels are following antagonistic, competitive, impassive, friendly, harmonious. Ooh. Harmonious is nice. Just I like the word, you know. Uh, thematically, having a high level of unity means that you'll enjoy internal stability and have house members that, generally speaking, adopt a friendly attitude towards each other. But you'll pay for it with a reduced capability to wage war efficiently. Well, Casas bellies come more expensive to use and you can no longer use the invasion Casas belly. A low level of unity provides you with the opposite. You'll gain a great deal of military might, allowing you to more easily conquer large swaths of land, but pay the price of reduced internal stability. Depending on your playstyle, you might enjoy a particular direction more than the other, regardless of your own preference. Having either low or high levels of unity is meant to be equally viable. Now that's interesting. That's interesting, and I think you can also agree with that. That's an interesting thing. You have a bar, basically, which is, you know, like, this is negative and this is positive. But they're saying that they want either, wherever you end up, being a thing you can work with. So I find that to be very interesting. So let's see. Uh, oh, they're, they're having the screenshots of all the little effects. We're not going to read all of them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, because it's, it doesn't say, like, what, for, what, for example, is antagonistic succession. I don't know. Um, let's see. Victory, white peace, and defeat have various effects on house vassal opinion. Well, great. What are the various effects? <laughs> that is a little bit vague. House members may challenge their house head in order to take their place. That we had in the other one as well. All right. House vassals are significantly more likely to cre uh, create claim on factions. Now, that's imp uh, impressive. That's impressive. Because claim on factions, they can be a little bit of a of a problem, you know. So I'm not going to look at all the stages. Instead, we look at the at the least and the most, and just kind of skim over the other ones. So interesting. Let's see. Casas Belly requires a specific level of fame. Require one less. Okay. So it's just easier to wage war, just as they described. I don't, like, th just from a role play perspective, if your people are kind of struggling with one another and are angry with one another, why would they be more likely to want to go to an external war? I don't fully grasp that. I'm trying to find real-world examples where it's like... Yeah, okay, maybe. Like, during the Cold War, if you, if you have just inter external enemies against which everyone can unite, that kind of works. Okay, fine. I, I, I can live with that. Let's see. So, competi uh, competitive is... Members can use a fabricate hook scheme against each other. Uh, more likely... Okay, all right, okay. I see. Every 10 years. And here you don't have any limitation on the invasion causes belly. Interesting. Uh, we've already seen this. Friendly succession. Okay. Rescue house members as a causes belly. Hello. Hello. Now, I like this one. Rescue house members. Um... Anecdote time. <laughs> uh, generally, I'm I'm a peaceful Crusader Kings player. I, you know, I wage my wars, I fight my battles, but I'm not vindictive or anything. Like I don't I don't go on on all out battles. But one time I was actually playing a clan in Crusader Kings two, and one of my daughters was imprisoned. Can you imagine? And she was made a slave. And I am the great Khan, and someone took my daughter and made th her their slave. So I went to war, trying to bring home my daughter. But there isn't really a mechanic for that in Crusader Kings 2 all that much. You can pay ransom, but for some reason I couldn't pay it for her. So I was just, yeah, I was just going and trying my best. But I couldn't, 
I couldn't get her back because I defeated them and I took everything. But my daughter, being a slave still, was simply passed on to the next member of the family that had imprisoned her. So what I did then was spend the entire lifespan of my ruler uh, hunting down and killing every last member of that family until my daughter was finally free. Um, here, this is now a little bit easier. I don't have to go on a murderous rampage anymore to bring back daughters if they are in prison. I like this. That is a, that is a good change. I appreciate it. So let's see. Unify the house causes belly. Mm, okay. No, yeah, maybe if someone passes outside of your realm. Okay. Uh, cannot use invasion causes belly. All right. Okay. House losses are less likely to create factions. Casa's belly cost goes up. Okay. Dread decay minus 20%. Interesting. So people fear you more. <laughs> yeah. Crusader Kings writes the best stories. I, I swear to you. It's it's one of those games, just like D&D, kind of ruins RPGs because it's just the the possibilities and the creativity is just unlimited, literally. The same is for Cru Crusader Kings 3. Like, I can't play other strategy games anymore, especially not grand strategy games, because the many, many mechanics that Crusader Kings has just lead to these really weird subplots. You never expected that they would be there. Like, you might receive, one day you might receive a hunting dog, and then uh, suddenly, a, a good portion of your game time is spent on uh, either protecting or trying to, you know, better train your dog because it's there. While you're still king or emperor of something and waging war and whatnot, but suddenly there's like, your dog wants to play. And he's like, ah, I'm going to play with my dog. The war can wait. The dog, that is that is where it's at, right? Or a cat, you know. I, I'm not sure if you can have both, actually, but maybe. Uh, let's see. So, Harmonious, last one. Rescue house members causes belly. Very good. Um, house members can befriend each other. Interesting. Befriending is, at the moment, something that is locked into one of those uh, lifestyle trees, which are basically just talent trees. Uh, so, this is something that diplomatic uh, characters have. It's a bit of a problem for those that have the diplomacy lifestyle, because, you know, it's just... Uh, <laughs> why would you pick it then? May I mean it could go down, right? So still somewhat helpful, but eh. Let's see. Other than the passive effect, you also gain access to a set of unique decisions, most of which are available only to the house head, as they provide powerful boons for the entirety of the house. Uh, so there's going to be events tied to these, uh, which is probably. Um, the things that were a little bit unclear and vague earlier. The primary currency of these decisions is piety. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> Since most clans belong to Islamic faith, uh, it's like a natural fit. Besides, piety is generally more difficult to get than prestige, where, hence my reaction, piety is hard to get, uh, making you consider where and how you spend that hard-earned piety. I agree. They got me there. Can't deny that. Uh, some of the decisions um, blah, 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 make use of a completely new type of modifier. A modifier that scales on the number of landed house members. If you're like me and you like to utilize nepotism to the fullest, these modifiers can become incredibly powerful. Be mindful that the piety cost will increase accordingly. Now, this is good. There's Honestly, there's, there's more downsides than upsides at the moment to um, having many of your own family uh, have, like, uh, a a title. Because then they can challenge you to get, to get your titles, generally. Um, and this sounds like there's finally a positive to that, beyond if you die, you get to play as one of them. Uh, for all your models out there, you can use scaling modifiers in every place... You use regular modifiers. You simply feed it a value and how you want it to scale. Ooh, very interesting. I, I don't use mods, but I, I understand that this is interesting. 
Uh, let's look at an example. If your house is antagonistic, you can use the decision. Reinforce army with loyal officers. All right. So you get loyal officers for 10 years. Uh, and it costs you 50 gold and 460 piety. Hello, boy. Okay, that's big. That's crazy. Uh, and it does the following. The members of this house have pooled their resources together to strengthen the troops within their armies. So... Increases per landed house member by plus 14. Uh, man at arms damage goes up. That's pretty big. Uh, man at arms toughness goes up. It's also pretty big. Man at arms are really important here. Okay. Last but certainly not least, un uh, unity directly affects the outcome of your succession. Ah, now we get to it. Each level has an impact on the outcome of how titles are inherited, and the succession changes automatically as your house unity changes. They all maintain a, a variant of partition, meaning the titles will always be split by some extent. Ew, I don't like that. Why? <laughs> when you're an antagonistic, all eligible children inherit equal shares. Yeah, I can feel that in feudalism. That's the standard. If you are harmonious, the primary heir inherits the majority of the titles, at least two-thirds. Eh, with varying degrees in between. At worst, this means that you don't have to deal with a confederate petition, and at best you have an easier time accessing a superior version of high petition. The drawback, while you can try to get a single heir succession law, such as primogenitor, it will be more difficult and expensive to do so. Okay, but you can still do it. All right. Fine. Uh, so what this means, basically, I'll just explain it for you real quick. Um, in other strategy games, you know, you just kind of conquer your land and then you have that land. In Crusader Kings, once you die, your ruler that you're currently playing dies, people want to inherit stuff. And as it was in a feudal uh, everywhere, basically, and still is in, in some places, I, I, I would say, um, your heirs divide up what you leave them. Right? I mean, it still happens today, but it's just very seldom it's about land anymore. Um, and there are various ways of how that is divided up. And obviously, since you now play your primary heir after the death of your current character, you want to retain the most of it. So you remain as powerful as your forebearer was, and you don't have to reclaim everything after you die. Uh, and getting either primogenitor, meaning your eldest inherits everything, or ultimogenitor, meaning your youngest inherits everything. Uh, house seniority, I think it's just the eldest member of the house inherits everything. Um, there are other versions here where it's just like decided how it's exactly split. And what they're saying is for a clan, you mainly go here, which roleplay based makes sense, uh, I think. It fits the clan. Uh, but there's still a chance to potentially get these later. Okay. Agreed. It's not too bad. If it weren't possible, then I would be kind of upset. But I like this. This is decent. Let's see. Now that we know that you, what Unity does, let's explore how it's impacted by gameplay. As mentioned previously, Unity is all about the members of a house and how they interact. This will become apparent as you start interacting with your family members. A lot of existing interactions have been updated to also have an impact on your unity in different ways. Whenever you are playing as clan, that is, taking what we call divisive actions, such as revoke a title or imprisonment against the fellow house members will naturally reduce your house unity. I never do these. Really. I never, I never get around to being a meanie. I, I should I should I should focus more on being a mean person in these games. Um, meanwhile, unifying actions such as negotiate alliance or offer ward will increase unity. I try and negotiate alliances a lot. I never offer ward because they call it a, a hostage, which I find repulsive. <laughs> it's it's the truth of it, but uh, um, wait, no, offer ward is not the same as exchange hostage. Uh, that, that's a difference. Um, Offer ward is just, hey, I have this child. Would you please educate it for me, <laughs> basically? Um, Unity is therefore a really byproduct of how you and your fellow house members interact with each other. Okay, makes sense. With that said, the house head enjoys a number of additional actions, giving them greater degree and control of how they want to direct the unity in their house. The foremost of these decisions is which the head actively takes a stance and chooses the direction to steer the unity. 
Then we also have two new interactions. The head, uh, no, yeah. Uh, the head can use on a member of their house, both of which acts as a double-edged sword and have some clear advantages on drawbacks. Okay. So you steer toward harmonious or antagonistic. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, accuse of decadence. Uh, that was a mechanic before. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. All right, decadence. Uh, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> um, I don't know if you always get the stress or if that's uh, related to what you are. Unity goes down. Um, the one who gets accused of decadence loses piety, gains more stress. The house members don't like him. Bigger chance to kill him. Oh, no, no, no. This, uh, I've played this a lot. Um, it's not new. This is basically a dev diary on the upcoming changes for how it is. So these bits that we're discussing today, these are going to be new to the game that has already been out since 2020, I think. Yeah. All right. So, uh, how said whether the claims are true or not? Okay. Very good. Interesting. This is interesting. Seems uh, hostile scheme success chance plus ten percent. That's good. If you want to kill him, you have a ten percent better time at trying to do it. Uh, this is important. Um, extol virtuousness. Let's see. He gets more piety. He gets more house opinion, and people have a harder chance to kill him because the clan is like, "Man, this this lad, he's great. We don't we don't go and kill him. We like him." Let's see. Uh, there are, of course, many more interactions. Far too many. Ugh. Are there? I don't like this sentence. I don't like it. I'll explain in a moment. Let's read it first. There are, of course, many more actions. Far too many to list them all here, which will have an impact on your unity. Worth mentioning is that the immediate impact of these interactions is fairly small, but they stack up over time, especially when you are not the only one within your house who will be using them. Ooh, ominous. Uh, the rest of... What's happening matters is basically what they're saying. Rest assured that you'll have plenty to explore as you get your hands on the updated clan government later this year, which will be included with the free update launching alongside Legacy of Persia. Very good. You like to see it. Uh, I don't like this sentence for one reason. It's promising too much. There are, of course, many more actions. Far too many to list all of them here. I don't believe you. <laughs> I... Like these are um, these are very specific interactions. There are very few of these already. I don't think they're gonna add more of these very specific ones. What I think was gonna happen is events that already exist in the game are going to have these modifiers added. Where before it didn't have that, now it's oh this will up or lower your unity. That's what's gonna happen. So I'm sure there are gonna be a bunch that are flavored specifically for this. But, uh, yeah, this is a bold claim, which is a little bit too bold for my taste. All right, and that's the dev diary. Uh, interesting, to, to say the least. I don't... I still don't think this is enough to, to make clan really stand out. But then again, playing Muslim wasn't all that different from feudal either in Crusader Kings 2. So this might just work. This might just be enough. Um, sounds good to me anyway.